Have you ever started a project full of excitement only to find yourself tangled in a web of confusing code and unclear APIs? You're not alone. What if I told you that there's a secret technique top developers use to create better projects and smoother APIs, a method that you are probably not using? Hey, I'm Jan, I'm the CTO of React Squad and in this video I'm gonna share with you a little known technique for better API design called Readme Driven Development or RDD. But what exactly is Readme Driven Development? It is simple, you write your Readme before you write your code. And in this readme, you write the API of your code as if your code, your project, your framework, your REST API, whatever it is that you are building, already exists. Then you share your readme with your coworkers if it's for a work-related project or with your friends if it's for a side project so they can provide feedback. Improve your readme based on their input and repeat this process until everyone is happy and all of the edge cases have been addressed. Readme-driven development frequently goes hand in hand with test-driven development. You write the tests that capture the API in your readme and then you write the code to make your tests pass. Here's how it works. Write the readme as if the code already exists, share that readme with your coworkers and implement their feedback, then write the test that captures the API of your readme and finally write the code that make your tests pass. Readme-driven development has a ton of benefits. It forces you to think about the inputs and the outputs first. By focusing on your API upfront, you prevent implementation details from leaking into your API design. Writing out the API first lets your coworkers critique it and discuss technical design implications. The goal is to come up with an API that offers the best developer experience. RDD helps to define the project's purpose and scope from the start. This clarity reduces bugs caused by a misunderstanding of the features being built. It can also help to prevent scope creep, keeping the project focused on its intended goals. By solidifying your API upfront, you can avoid the redundant work of rewriting your code later when changes are more complex and costly. If you think about all your edge cases first, you can avoid unnecessary reworks. By focusing on your readme first, you ensure that documentation is not an afterthought, but rather a core part of your development process. This leads to better and more comprehensive documentation, which benefits both the maintainers and the users. A well-documented codebase with a clear readme makes it easier for new team members to understand the project quickly, significantly reducing their onboarding time. And finally, when you write documentation first, teams can work in parallel because everyone knows what to expect from each other. In other words, readme-driven development closely aligns with one of the most important principles in software design made famous by the Gang of Four. Program to an interface, not to an implementation. When you write your readme, include everything that a normal readme would include. List the features of your project. Write down why you are creating it and what problems it should solve. This helps users as well as yourself understand what the project should be able to do. And based on these features, you can plan your API. Include how to install your package or library. If your module depends on any other packages, list those dependencies. Then show how to use your package or library and what configuration options are available. Now, the most obvious point is you want to include the API of your package or library. Make sure that you cover the most important use cases. I want to mention both usage and the API separately because one forces you to think about your package from the perspective of your user, while the other forces you to think about it from the perspective of the developer. Explain how to contribute to your package or library. When working on an internal development team, you can either capture the existing development process or use this as an opportunity to suggest improvements and bring in new ideas. Lastly, you want to include the license of your package or library. Now, let's look at an example together and walk through the four steps of readme-driven development. Suppose you want to create a simple package that generates random integers. Now, the first step is to write down your readme and capture what your project should do and what problems your features solve. Start by writing the name of your package, a short description 
and then list the features that you have in mind. Again, this step helps you to be clear about the scope of your project. Once you've figured out what you want to do, it's time to show your users how they can get started and how to use your project. So include the sections on installation instructions, usage examples, your API documentation, a contributing section, and finally a license. Now let's say you take your README to your coworkers so they can critique it. Your coworkers point out a few ways to improve your random number generator. First, you should be able to call it without arguments. Second, it should default to a range from 0 to 100. Third, it should take in named arguments via an options object. And lastly, it should be a named export so that if you want to add future functions to your package, you can do so easily. You agree with your coworkers and update your README. So, your README now looks like this. You add a feature to your feature section. You split the usage section into basic usage and when you specify a range. And lastly, you update your API reference to include the new features. You show your updated README to your coworkers and they are happy with it. So it's time for step 3 to write some tests. For that you need a project. So create a new directory and then run npm init to initialize a new Node.js project. Add your README to your project, then install the testing library of your choice. In this case we're gonna use Vitest. Then add a testing command to your package JSON. Now you can write your tests. You're gonna write two tests, one for the named parameters and one for no arguments at all. When you write tests for functions that generate random output, a good technique is to generate many outputs and then making sure that all of those outputs are conforming to the constraints that your random output should conform to. For example, in the first test case, you can make sure when you give a min and a max value that all of the generated numbers are between those two numbers and when you call your function without any arguments that all of the numbers that your function generate are within 0 and 100. Now create a new file for your generate random integer function and then export a function that returns not a number. When you now run your tests, you should see that both of them fail. Now it's time for the fourth and final step of readme driven development, which is to write the code to make your tests pass. Implement your generate random integer function to use named parameters and then use math.random together with math.floor to make sure that the function returns a value between the minimum and the maximum value. Once you've done that, run your tests again and they should pass now. Now that you've walked through a simple example for readme driven development, it's time to answer the question when do you want to use readme driven development? And there are two scenarios where RDD can be helpful. First, when you're working on a complex API that you need to get right, usually used by many stakeholders. For example, when you are working on something open source or your team of your company is working on something that they want to offer as open source. For example, an SDK that connects to the service that you're building. Another use case is if you're working on an internal tool where multiple teams of your company will be using it, it is important that you get the API right and receive feedback from the future users, aka your teammates. And lastly, when working on an app or service where multiple components interact, readme driven development helps to outline how these components work together, promoting a better understanding and consistency across the system and your team. The second use case for readme driven development is when large cross-functional teams need to work together in parallel and you want to make sure that one team isn't blocked by the other team. For example, you can have a backend team that creates a readme for their REST API so that the frontend team knows what requests and responses will look like. You might be asking yourself, doesn't this take extra time? Well, yes it does, but only in the beginning. Later it pays off big time. When you write the readme first and then discuss it with your team, that obviously adds an extra task on everyone's plate, slowing you down when compared to just jumping into the development right away. But think about it, you need to discuss your code with your team anyways, so does it really cost you extra time? Why not use a streamlined and developer friendly process for your discussions? And on the other hand, 
Readme-driven development offers a high return on investment under the right circumstances. When working solo, there's no need for readme-driven development unless you want to use it as a tool to plan the app or service that you are building. Otherwise, when you're working alone and you're already using test-driven development, there's little value in readme-driven development because you already get the better API design by writing your tests first. Once you have your README for your dream API for your 10x vision that handles all of the edge cases that you and your coworkers can think of, it's time to decide on the order in which you want to implement your features. You want to think of it like building a startup. Capture the big vision first, but start by building out your MVP. Focus on core functionality for version 1 and save additional functionality for later releases. Also, don't be afraid to push back if too many people want to add extra features or edge cases. It's perfectly fine to have your project handle certain use cases well in the beginning and then save more functionality for later versions. Too many developers skip readme-driven development because it's one of the less widely discussed methodologies out there and their excitement to jump into code overshadows their willingness to plan their projects. But now you are in on the secrets and you know how and when to use readme-driven development to drive success to your project. So the next time that you are working on a project and you need to build out a new feature or even like a big library, write the readme first. It might feel a little bit unusual, but the benefits are substantial. I love you very much. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more advanced coding content. And then the YouTube algorithm thinks that you will enjoy watching this video next.